Welcome to the Winners Find a Way show and podcast with your host, Trent M. Clark, three-time World Series coach, CEO of Leadershipity, serial entrepreneur, having started 12 companies, coach to the 1%, and an international speaker. This show is going to be your go-to podcast for facing adversity, being inspired, and overcoming obstacles, all from the best in the world, business, sports, and leadership. Hate the crappy ingredients in many beverages and energy drinks? Rebellious Infusions are the go-to functional beverage. They have five or fewer plant-based organic ingredients. No sugar, no calories, loaded with antioxidants to boost your immune system. And L-thionine for brain health. Rebellious Infusions are available at drinkrebellious.com. Rethink your drink. For 10% off of your next purchase, use the code 99999. Welcome to the Winners on the Way show. I am your host. Excited to welcome my guest, Scott Fox. Say, say hello, Scott. Hello there. Thank you, Trent. Appreciate you having me on here. Yeah, excited to have you. I am the host, Trent Clark, CEO of Leadership, a serial entrepreneur, international speaker, and longtime coach in professional baseball, coaching in three World Series, and excited to have Scott join the show. If you were a first-time listener on the show, let's talk a little bit about what the show is about. I'm on here. Have you ever faced stiff adversity, felt like the losses are mounting and need to find a better way? If you are, are I think you've come to the right place. Whether you are already an entrepreneur, an athlete, a business leader, or just looking to start your journey or continue journey to being elite, this is the perfect place. On our show, we talk to one percenters about the challenges they faced and or things that they've overcome or helped others overcome. And Scott, as a fellow coach, I really appreciate you coming on and talking about it. Tell Scott a little bit before we get going on you, where can people can find you? Yeah, you can find me at uh, my website, which is the, that's T-H-E, championplaybook.com. There's a contact Scott page there, and I'd love to hear from you. Uh, I'm also on Instagram at, at coach underscore Scott underscore Fox. And of course, I'm on. Nice. All right. So there you go. You can find Scott Fox, which is common name. So it's really important that it's hard when you're in the social media world with a common name. It's not easy to always get found. So, yeah. and listen, hey, listen, you always want to be a champion. So you can just go to the champion playbook right there and find out right there's his website. He's got the whole thing right there to say how to be a champion. So pretty awesome. Scott, a little bit about you. DC area guy, mental health and sports performance coach, went to Brown University. You're an Ivy League man. And uh, of course, tell us a little bit about, you have another business, The Sanctuary. Talk a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. So the, look, the, Trent, the, the overarching theme of my life here at this stage seems to be well-being. And I spent 30 years plus in commercial real estate in the shopping center industry. And what I saw was that there was a broken industry really that was looking at things through a lens of solely financial vehicle. We got to make money. That's important. However, we also have to take care of people and we have to start to make decisions that are really good for communities as well as individuals in a true sense. And I could talk for a long time about that. Happy to, because it, it actually is related to the sport world business that I have as well. And uh, my partner in the sanctuary and I are talking to institutional real estate owners and we want to convince them that uh, there's a, a better way for people and they should start to think like that. Love it. All right. Now, what most people don't know about you as a elite mental health and performance coach, because we're always talking about getting the best out of everybody, is meanwhile, while you're dealing with people's minor details about helping them improve that 1%, 2%, and you're constantly focused on this wellness, you are battling chronic illness. Yeah. And Looking at you, Scott, no one thinks like, oh, man, this is a healthy fit. Look at him. He's an Adonis. This is a world beater, right? <laughs> You're a good-looking man. And then, like, this is not what people suspect about your life. That's very true. And I'm, I'm happy to share because we need to share these kind of things to help each other. And uh, I'm able to look and be and do what I want to do because of the processes that I've been fortunate enough to assemble. And we'll talk more in depth about that. Yeah, I, for the last four years or so, have been dealing with chronic illness in the form of, boy, multiple things here. And I'm happy to, again, talk about all of it because I think it's helpful for everybody because this is like the silent epidemic and you're going to find this become more and more prevalent. Let's see. Let's go through the list here. So I got some intestinal bacterial stuff, some fungal overgrowth, some disease and heavy metals that shouldn't be in my body. And what am I missing here? 
I don't know. I'm, I'm happy that I'm missing it because honestly, a lot of what this becomes is one has to learn that you are not the disease and to even kind of avoid the labels. But I'm able to function, again, because I've got some really cool processes. A lot of the, I'll call it a battle, although it ultimately is a, of being chronically ill, is it's an emotional thing. And I do believe that body, mind, and spirit, we, it's all woven together. Yeah. And so I know in our Western medicine, we tend to just focus on the physical and there's usually a pharmaceutical answer we're seeing that that just doesn't work for a lot of chronically ill people. And then the emotional piece of it, people actually get worse as they go through the traditional Western medicine because it can just really treat you poorly. And that's not to say that there aren't great doctors out there. I've had some, but in general, systemically, there are some real issues that we all need to address. Yeah, no, I think that's really good. And what I'm hearing is, is that one of the things I preach is that things are holistic right? They are holistic. They are just, we categorize things and going, Hey, I'm so good at this one thing. Physically, I have 4% body fat. I am a, Oh, that's awesome. Like how's that affecting your mental or how is your running and your speed? Like, Oh, well, I don't work on that. <laughs> like, right. well, wait a minute, like holistically, that's going to be a problem, right? Like if you have 4% body fat and pull your hamstrings, every time you got to run over 10 miles an hour, like it's not good. Right. So it's going to definitely eliminate your ability to gain athletic prowess if you pull a hamstring every time over over 10 miles an hour so we think that we're not really training everything but from a health perspective it really is a holistic approach and let's talk a little bit about did you, as a kid like hey growing up i'm gonna be a whatever but ultimately a mental health and sports <laughs> performance coach. This is what I want to do. What was the child life like for no, you? Man. That you had that moment where you like, Hey, I want to do something different. I want to make a difference, whatever that was. Well, look, uh, that's such, uh, I laugh because look, I'm old enough. So that book in the 1970s, nobody was talking. Well, that's not true. People who were kind of weird, if you will, in California, probably were talking about this kind of stuff, meditating yeah. and doing all sorts of stuff. And uh, no, I didn't think about what I wanted to do. Both my parents worked for the federal government as I was growing up. And that's very typical here in the DC area. And uh, it was really just kind of play sports, have fun. And then I got the dream to be a professional football player. That's what I, only thing I ever really thought about. And so I got to go to college and play baseball. I played at Brown University and I played for a gentleman who was a former major league all-star starting pitcher for an all-star game. Can you imagine? This guy must have been incredible in his day. Yeah. And uh, he was played for the Senators, early 60s. Yeah. And I uh, thought, oh, this would be great. So I go there and I had my moments. I also had my moments where I just couldn't look like I <laughs> belonged on the field. And yeah. so consistency, right? Consistency is the name of the game in so many things in life and baseball in particular. So I'd have scouts take a look at me and they're like, oh yeah, injured. let's keep, keep an eye on Fox. And then they'd see me again. It's like, huh. And then I got hurt my senior year and I missed it all. And that was it. I was done. And so I then rolled the clock forward as to why I do this. Well, let's keep it in college for a moment. So where there was that moment in college where my manager called me over and he's like, hey, Fox, you got a million dollar swing. You got a 10 cent head. And I knew what he was saying. It was kind of a harsh way to, to address it. But that was old school, right? And I'm just standing there waiting for him to tell me, okay, what do I do to be more consistent? Nothing. All he had is awareness. And I'm just being polite in granting yeah, that fair, label. Right? Yeah. And uh, I remembered that. And I was frustrated. He was frustrated. No answers, though. And so yeah. as I became a coach, and I had been coaching before I even went to college. I, my dad loved to coach youth sports. I was his assistant coach in football and baseball. And uh, kind of been there. But I wanted to become the best coach I could be when my own kids started to play youth sports. So mm -hmm. my daughter was the older of the two still is the older of the two. She was about nine years old, wanted to play baseball with the boys. I was like, all right, way to go. And we'll, I'll be your coach and we're going to have some fun. And so I said, what can I do to become the best coach? And I just looked back at my own deficiencies and thought, okay, how can I help somebody else who was just like me, full of potential, but got limited by their internal constraints? And so I dug in and this was like back 2008, and as fate would have it, there was another recession going on in the commercial real estate world back then. The bubble was bursting. And so I had a lot of time on my hands. And all this, this bookcase behind me, you can see, is full of books. I love books. I love reading. And I love talking to people who can give me knowledge. As you have said, Trent, hey, watch out who you get advice from. I like 
finding top sources that are out there. And I've been blessed to have some great mentors and some great information. And so I started to, uh, to learn and I came across some, a lot of processes actually that could be helpful for athletes in terms of performance regarding the non-physical, as I call it. So the, we'll call it mental and emotional and spiritual too. The challenge with some of them is that this were not practical. You know, I don't want to have any machinery necessary to help my clients. I want them to be empowered after I work with them so that they can do this themselves on the field or off the field. And there's some really cool things, but again, they weren't practical, but I did find things that were practical and they have no downside. They're just at worst a benign use of time, but at best life changing. And that's my threshold, my filter. Again, I want stuff that's going to work and there's no downside to it other than you tried something. Yeah. Well, I think it's so good. And I think there was so many times going in the seventies and it's probably still happening today, right? That coaches can't know everything. And I really honor and appreciate that. And there were so many of those sayings that, hey, you need to be more consistent. Hey, coach, how do I do that? Well, I don't know, but you need to. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and no one's really saying, I don't know either. Back then, nobody said, I don't know. Oh, I know. Like, Vulnerability uh, you know, had not come into that. the Maybe lexicon. you and I need to look at that together. One of the things that has always been a key for me, and I probably haven't communicated it very well, even on this youth sports, is you know, coming from a professional environment, you train up. This is why we want to sign Scott Fox at 18, not 21 or 22 out of Brown. Because when you're at Brown, hey, you're a full-time student. You got eight, 10 hours a day mm -hmm. into your studies. And then you get to practice for two, three hours, right? Or train. And right. now we're like, yeah, no, no, you don't have time to study. You need to be with us training for five to eight hours a day, like training, playing this. So you can imagine that compilation over time of an athlete who's 18, take those three years Get that get four to five more hours a day than you do, right? I mean, a cumulative matter, like they are progressing way beyond. I remember a college, yeah, a big college coach was saying the SEC is like a baseball. And I was like, yeah, yeah not close, <laughs> like <laughs> not close because of the time factor that you get these kids at that age. And they've got all these professional coaches that gather all their information. Like you said, Scott, where do you get information? They've got all these people that have already played, that have already taken all their experiences from all these other coaches, and they bring that into that environment. The hyper learning is crazy. And when you get to a college environment, hey, there's three coaches. One's a restricted earnings coach. You know, like They don't have time one-on-one -on -one time. There's a roster of almost 30 kids. It's a very challenging time to get this hyper development like the professionals do. So it's very different in that. But one of the things that really I struggle with as, and for all you parents, I want you listening here mm -hmm. in youth sports is Scott's asking your child to be at practice four days a week and be consistent and be there the full hour and a half or two hours. And that consistent practice is what's developing consistency, right? And then we go, Oh, well, listen, he can't make it because his sister's got a recital over here and this, that, and I get that. Like things are crazy and busy and we're overscheduled. But then go, I don't know why my kid's not consistent. He doesn't show up consistently in practice. like, and, and consistently doesn't go out and do it every day. And so we're asking for consistency, yet we don't practice it at all. Like, right, right. We're, that's we're, not really going to happen. Yeah, Is that fair? So, there are so many things like that happening in youth sports. And I just had this conversation with a, a coach in the golf world. And she's also in her late 50s or so. And commented on how different the world is right now when it comes yeah. to parents and kids, et cetera. And even physically, gosh, we could have a whole podcast talking about the difference. Kids are in generally much worse physical shape than they were 30 years ago when I was first starting some coaching. And on that, there's a, like you, you're a physical guy too. I also have a kettlebell certification. I did some training with that as well. I think it's really important for everybody to have some aspect of mind, body, spirit going on in themselves. And coaches don't have to be an expert in every aspect of it. But I think you'd agree that uh, you got to have something in, in, in all of those buckets. With regards to what is desire for consistency or desire for anything, humans are interesting. We will adapt to just about anything that happens to us. We call yeah. it stress is the good stress. You yeah. put some stress on your body, you're going to get some hypertrophy. You're going you're gonna to get some yeah. more explosiveness. Whatever it is you're training, your body will react to. And guess what? Your mind is the same. And uh, right. the brain is it has this neuroplasticity going on and... These are some things that we talk about a lot now. And in the coaching world, you're right. The coaches can't know everything. It's a lot harder to be a coach these days than it was a few decades ago, even maybe one decade ago. 
the stress that is placed on these youth sports kids is immense. I know that there are high school kids for sure, maybe middle school kids, I don't know, that spend more time training than I did as a D1 ball player at Brown. And I just have to shake my head. It's like, what, what are you doing, parents and coaches? I mean, is this really right? Because all the experts says that's not good. These young kids need to be out there doing a variety of sports and they need to have free time. Do you rarely, I rarely see a bunch of kids walking around the neighborhood, free time, just doing whatever they want to do. That used to be the norm yeah. in America, but yeah. we're all fearful now and we're all overscheduled and we think that we place that with scheduled activities. And it's just not the same thing on any level, physiologically, emotionally, anything. It's funny in, I mean, I don't think it's funny. It's actually sad, right? Yeah. The fact that if eight or 10 kids are sitting around without ball gloves and they're just on their bikes, someone's ready to call the police. These eight <laughs> kids are out on their bikes. We need to check this. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> their kids out on their bikes. Like that's sad, right? Yeah, that's it is sad. sad. That that's so what again, it's come to. As leaders, and you're 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 leader. We're all leaders here, and we we have a responsibility. And it actually can be fun to give these kids some tools to deal with these greater expectations. And yeah, you can try to peel it back and kind of live the old life, man. You better be out in the middle of nowhere with no cell phones connections because these kids know what's going on in the world and, and creating that little bubble. I don't know. We can have a debate as to whether or not it's even good for them. But we absolutely, if we're going to have these societal expectations heaped on them, we need to give them some tools. And that's what I like to do. Great. Tell me about, let's, let's take you back through the time where you felt, hey, you were down, but not out. Things were not going well. Your mental physical is, is being challenged. Things are just in a bad way for you. How, talk to, take us back through that. Don't want to relive it, but want to revisit it for a minute. Right. And, and let's revisit that and talk to me a little bit about what happened and then how you got out of that. Yeah. I think that I'm going to stick with my chronic illness story because I was at my lowest as a, as a person. I honestly was an athlete. We, I think, take it for granted that our body is always going to be there and that we're gonna always be able to do the things we wanna do. And then personally, I grew up in a household where our valued kind of traits was intelligence. My parents, my dad has a PhD in physics, my mother's a biologist, brother's an engineer. And when you lose that cognitive function as well, whoa, that was hard for me. And mm -hmm. so again, when I went through the worst of this illness, I couldn't control my thoughts. I couldn't control my emotions. Physically, I couldn't do what I wanted to do. I just felt miserable. And I am grateful for that. And I'm grateful because it developed pieces of me and it made me dig deep. Part of that is you learn to be more compassionate, or I did, and more empathetic even to feel other people's pain. And I never really knew what a, a panic attack even was because I never had anything with that. I didn't have anxiety. I didn't have anything. When these little microbes get inside of your gut, there's a gut-brain connection, folks. And when you, that happens and you've got the toxins in your gut and you've got pathogens in your gut, parasites, et cetera, you can't think straight. You can't control your emotions. And there's a whole bunch of humility <laughs> that comes along when you experience something like that. And I had, I got to a point where I was, I had been faking it at work for about a year and a half. And I didn't tell anybody what was going on. I would just do my best. And I was in meetings where I could see people's mouths moving, but I didn't really follow what they were saying. And I'm just kind of nodding and smiling, which tells you a lot about corporate America. You can kind of fake it. Yeah, right. And, but I re eventually I reached a point where I was just unhappy. I couldn't do anything. And I went to the CEO of my company and I said, hey, I'm sorry I hid this from you, but for the past 18 months I've been ill and I need to take time off, extended sick leave. And it was handled very well. I did that. I thought I made some progress, which I had, but it was not the real progress. And I went back to work and then thankfully COVID hit and I got laid off along with a bunch of other people in commercial real estate in the industry. When people stopped paying rent and et cetera, there was a big shift that would have happened. And so after that happened, I had a, a longer period of time, at least six months of just doing everything daily about trying to heal myself. And what I learned out of all of that is, again, A, some humility. <laughs> Maybe I still need some more. Secondly is trust the process. I know we've kind of all heard and, and said those words somewhat if we've coached people. We're so fixated 
on getting results and we're looking like short term right in front of us. Oh, I didn't get the result. The process is no good. No, it's just that as a human, we were placing these artificial timelines in front of us and we wanted to get something like that. And isn't that where our society is, right? Trusting a process requires faith and knowledge for me. And so the processes for me, I still do them daily. I have a, a list of things that I do. It takes me a, over two hours to get out of the house in the morning. But I, I'll say I have to do these things in order to keep, keep myself at a high level or else I will be in the fetal position on the bed with the, until this gunk gets out of me. And if it was an easy solution out there, there would be nothing called chronic illness. We would take a pill and that's what people want, but yeah. that's not, that is not how it works. And so that's my journey is one of vulnerability and learning that it's okay not to be in control, having faith that there is a way out and that, it, and that there is a better way. And that's really been the hallmark of my business is there's a better way. And I'll stop there and let you jump in. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really the highlight of the show, Scott. I mean, winners, I love the quote, winners when shown data that they are losing, find a way to win. That's from Stephen Covey, our, his son, and Chris McChesney. And from a book called The Four Disciplines of Execution, the reality is, is we're faced with these challenges and we may not have the answer. Like there, there may be a term of how long we're going to have to continue to find ways. I, I often love the uh, quote when I believe it was, I'm not sure who that was, who it was Edison who's following the light, right? And they say, Hey, you, you failed like 7,248 times. He's like, no, no, no. I've actually succeeded on 7,427 times. That is not the way to create electricity or light. Like, right. So like I'm, I'm getting there, right? Like right. I'm moving the ways of, of what's not working. I do know that. Right. And so learned a bunch of things along the way through all those notes. And that's some of the funniest things that people do not recognize. I think as you and I got some science background is that there's so many discoveries in science accidentally, right? Like we're like, mm -hmm. I wasn't, was I looking for, but when we did the research, like, Oh my gosh, look at all this right here that shows up. And I think that's, so important that we're we have our eyes on all all of it right it, it's part of that holistic approach and it's yeah. probably what concerns me about current society today is that logic says review all the data look at all the data look what's trending understand it all and i feel like now we just hone in on one piece of data and then build a narrative around it regardless of what the rest of it says mm. it's like whoa that is a danger zone for me What's your thought on Hate the crappy ingredients in many beverages and energy drinks? Rebellious Infusions are the go-to functional beverage. They have five or fewer plant-based organic ingredients. No sugar, no calories, loaded with antioxidants to boost your immune system. And L-thionine for brain health. Rebellious Infusions are available at drinkrebellious.com. Rethink your drink. For 10% off of your next purchase, use the code 99999. Thank you for listening to the Winners Find A Way show and podcast. Trent, together with the leaders who shared their learning and experiences through this show, are grateful for allowing them to help and support you on your journey to becoming your best. Write a review, rate us five stars, and share this episode to your network.